Wolfenstein 3D was a cultural and technological landmark that left its signature on nearly every aspect of the intersection of gaming and pop culture in the 90s. It was iconoclastic and brash, it implied explicitly anti-fascist themes and handled them in the way that all the action movies of the decade before it handled them, with American exceptionalism and ultraviolence. Though such a thing was relatively new to the burgeoning art form of gaming, which up to this point was still widely regarded as an entertainment medium for kids, Consoles were still marketed with the same tone and energy as toys, and computers were largely seen as devices for business applications. Wolfenstein 3D would be something of a prime mover in the shift in the culture and conversation of gaming to follow. From a technological standpoint, it popularized innovative techniques in the field of 3D, ray casting, a then new programming technique that made Wolfenstein 3D's groundbreaking visuals possible, for instance, hacking the notoriously slow machines to perform only the calculations needed to draw vertical lines. It looks dated as all hell today, but upon release it was the pinnacle of 3D technology in computer games, and a massive independent success based almost entirely on word of mouth through BBS distribution chains and the shareware market. But this wasn't Wolfenstein 3D's only lasting legacy. Though the hacking and modification of programs was a favorite activity of essentially all of the iconic game designers of the era, it was this particular one that would change the landscape of modding forever. Romero and Carmack's discovery and positive reception of the Wolf 3D modding scene would lead the developers to release modding tools for the next game to facilitate easier modding and level designing. And that game was Doom. Remember how I covered Sergeant Mark IV's Brutal Doom and defended it as not only a gateway into Doom itself, but also pointed out how it was a gateway to Doom modding? Well, some of you got really pissed off when I said that, but the thing about me is, I'm generally right. A lot of you jumped into my comments to recommend Project Brutality to me, even though I mentioned it and displayed it within the context of my video, and yeah. Thank you for enforcing my point about how brilliant that mod is, because that was sort of the underlying point even if it wasn't the primary focus of the video. Sergeant Mark IV's Brutal Doom was so fundamentally groundbreaking that while you were on some forum complaining about feature creep, the design concepts and gore system were influencing other transformative works. Well guess what, kids? I felt like reifying this point, with absolutely no motivation from the socio-political climate of the United States whatsoever, by highlighting a mod that forked from Sergeant Mark's initial concept. Because I love Brutal Doom, love being right, and I love how much engagement I get when I cover Brutal Doom related topics. You need to call it. I can't call it for you. Well, it wouldn't be fair. I didn't put nothing up. Yes, you did. You've been putting it up your whole life, you just didn't know it. And that brings us to Zeo McCall's Brutal Wolfenstein, which essentially does for Wolfenstein 3D what Sergeant Mark IV did for Doom. And while I'm an EC Wolf kind of guy for a modern take on the purest experience, I do find some difficulty in recommending it for someone who didn't previously experience the game in its heyday. It's not really like recommending Doom. Like, I can easily recommend the vanilla experience of Doom with a source port that provides it, something like Doom Retro, which is a project that I love, by the way. I'd still argue that its design philosophy might feel a little dated when compared to modern shooters in the average taste, but the basic design that exists is sound. And the control scheme is so simplistic and universal that anyone with experience on a keyboard and mouse is going to grasp it. And the visual elements are decidedly retro, but they are there. Strobing lights, visual elements that are unique and distinct from others, and a sense of verticality overall. Wolfenstein 3D, by contrast, has aged considerably worse than its successor. Of course, this is because of the limitations of the technology of its era, but where Doom feels like a game that could be trendily retro, Wolfenstein 3D looks and feels archaic. I mean, even running through EC Wolf, which is miles beyond the DOSBox emulation experience, there are certain visual aspects that will feel lifeless by comparison. Not to mention, you know, the obscene amounts of hit scanning in 90s shooters in general. Wolfenstein 3D is very much a product of its time, and I don't mean in the dated nature of its visuals and mechanics. Rather, I mean in the cultural paradigm of its creation. It was released in 1992, mine, but the designers themselves were products of the 80s, growing up on movies like Rambo and Commando, a time when the concept of the gun-toting one-man army was in vogue, and people still believed wholeheartedly in the strength of the American dream and the concept of American exceptionalism writ large. And something else to consider as well is the concept of immersion was still relatively new when it came to games. John Carmack, the resident genius and the technological drive behind id Software's success, was obsessed with the idea of creating higher and higher states of immersion in his virtual worlds. 
So when I say that Wolfenstein 3D is a product of its time, what I mean to say is two things. One, the aim was to create a visceral, violent experience unlike anything seen on the relatively primitive PCs of the era. One that would put the player into the shoes of a traditional action hero. Two, they wanted to utilize new programming concepts like fast, first-person action perspectives and texture mapping to breathe life into the world to increase the immersive aspects of the game. Two things that had never really been achieved in tandem. So, you might ask, what does Zeo McCall's Brutal Wolfenstein do to further achieve these goals better than even the original in the modern era? Now obviously the technology is newer, that much is obvious without an explanation, but in as much as this plays like Brutal Doom, there's something about the way it clicks in Wolfenstein that feels unique and distinct. Now part of it is the intersection of the anti-fascist themes inherent to a game about indiscriminately killing Nazis and the abject, almost pornographic levels of violence found in the mod especially when you consider the iconography and themes that I touched on above. Every detail has been enhanced, from the feel of the weapons to the buckets of blood and gore they spray all over everything when you blow a Nazi apart or rip him to shreds with indescribable amounts of gunfire. And I do mean everything. Just watch me paint these Hitler paintings with the gore of a bunch of Nazis. Now in a nod to the original Apple II games, that created the Wolfenstein brand in the first place, intentional or not, partially damaged Nazis will occasionally attempt to surrender and beg for their lives, in which case you hit the insult key and cut their faces off, gaining a health bonus as a reward for indulging in your bloodthirst. The explosions are loud, violent, and capable of clearing entire rooms, but unlike Wolfenstein 3D, in Brutal Wolf, you can occasionally damage pieces of the environment creating shortcuts, which if I'm honest will occasionally negate the point of secret hunting, but that's actually okay because while Doom would generally mark off secrets with misaligned textures or sound cues, Wolfenstein wasn't so sophisticated, and on Bring em On difficulty, I recommend a generous heap of wall humping even if you find these shortcuts. But what of the immersive quality that John Carmack envisioned? While the primitive machines of the 90s being hacked to simulate 3D perspectives into texture map walls was more impressive than I can possibly state for its era, the modern taste is going to need something a bit more sophisticated graphically, I think. A little more modern. Remember, Wolfenstein 3D was described as cinematic in its day, with the key here being the phrase, in its day. For reference, this was basically the pinnacle of computer graphics in the 80s. In the digital world of the computer itself. So how do you make something that looks like this meet Carmack's initial vision of heightened states of immersion? You brutal doom the fuck out of it. The maps of Wolfenstein 3D are pretty bland to look at today, until the light maps, gore, and special effects of Brutal Doom are applied. I found my brain nullifying any real acknowledgement of the background music, which created a tense atmosphere. Every weapon? Violent. Shots rang out, reverberating out of my speakers as I dodged tracer fire. Fun fact, did you know that the point of the Nazis shouting their iconic phrases, such as Achtung, was meant to scare the player? This early brushstroke of first-person horror is enhanced by enemy placement, which is oftentimes buried deeply into corners and out of the player's direct line of sight. The same is true of the original Wolfenstein 3D, but look how bright it is. Juxtapose that with the color palette and the lighting of Brutal Wolf, which actually conveys the mood and atmosphere meant to be captured in the game, but wasn't really capable in the moment of its creation. And the further into Brutal Wolf you get, the more this is enhanced. Check out the effects on this electricity in the second episode. So does it feel immersive? Incredibly, especially in the Bring It On difficulty, where you have to be constantly alert to keep from getting smoked. The experience of capture for the sake of this video meant hours sucked away in the blink of an eye as I dodged bullets and ripped every Nazi in sight to shreds. And I want to mention once again, all the blood and gore. I know the company was initially called Ideas from the Deep, but id, being the pleasure principle in Freud's psychoanalytic theory, was a much more accurate moniker as the satisfaction you feel from blowing a Nazi apart and seeing his jawbone or his arm fly apart is so viscerally satisfying. It traps you into a loop of seeking that visceral feedback, probably identical to that of those who experienced it when it first released, but updated for, again, the modern taste. But what's unique, hearkening back to the previously mentioned anti-fascist philosophical underpinnings that encapsulate the idea of a lone soldier thwarting the plans of the most infamously evil political structure of modern history, you will find yourself compelled to be as brutal as humanly possible. Why? 
because seeing Adrian Carmack's brutal visions in higher resolution respects your intelligence. You see the skeleton hanging from the ceiling? You know what that is. This dog that's attacking you? Nobody wants to shoot dogs in games, but it kinetically and experientially highlights the existential corruption of the Nazi party as a whole. Particularly as a standout in this regard were the set of decorations in Episode 2, because I know what happened here. I know that it's horrific, I know that the Nazis experimented on other human beings, but unlike real life, I and I alone can do something about it. But here's what's really fascinating about Zeo McCall's Brutal Wolfenstein. Everything that I've highlighted above should be expected, purely because it is based on what could easily be considered the most infamous mod of all time. And yet, I still find myself impressed by the quality and care that Zeo has put into this particular iteration of the mod. Whereas in Brutal Doom, the immersion was roughly equivalent to that of the original game. It isn't vanilla Doom, but the ultimate goal is essentially the same. But there is no actual Doom guy, no mission to Mars, and no opening a portal to hell in real life. The immersive quality of both Doom and Brutal Doom is in the pure indulgence of it all, the transgressive nature of its absurdity, and placating the primal instinct of survival to weather the oncoming hordes of demons looking to lay siege to your homeworld. But because of this, it's patently fantasy. The greatest fantasy of all time, because Doom is the greatest game ever created in my opinion, but it is nevertheless a fantasy grounded in the phantasmagoria of pure instinct and anchored by its own absurdity. But the Holocaust, the Nazi party, the hoarding of ethnic treasures, these are all realities. I mean, yeah, BJ Blazkowicz is an action hero archetype and not an actual human being who ever existed. He is essentially an absurd anthropomorphic analogy for the Reagan era American exceptionalism during which the id4 came of age. There's no actual direct evidence that the Nazi party conducted research into the reanimation of corpses, and obviously the idea of Hitler having a mech suit is patently absurd. But it is, unlike Doom, something of a work of historical fiction. A power fantasy, yes, but there is a sense of vengeful empowerment endemic to this specific power fantasy that is rooted in the very real socio-political landscape of our very real world, and catalyzed through that one distinction, I think it stands apart from the mod that spawns it. Not better, certainly not worse, but equal in the way it achieves its diverging goals. And as a person who is admittedly looking at the political landscape of America at the same time as playing Brutal Wolfenstein, simultaneously rereading Masters of Doom and finding myself lamented by the tales of the two Johns who would stop at nothing to achieve their goals while also reading SCOTUS opinions and considering my own place in the socio-economic climate of the United States in 2022, I don't know. There's something that feels iconoclastic in the autonomy it grants to player. Something, maybe, that I'm incapable of feeling in my day-to-day -day life. As violent and over-the-top as the mod and the game that spawned it is, maybe there's something about the fact that it's rooted in realism that anchors the sense of immersion in a country that I feel increasingly alienated from and solipsistic about as I crest deeper into my 30s.